10 undercover cops and two black and white cops just swarmed me and arrested me, took me into custody, charged me with first degree murder. Trevor. What's up, man? What's up, buddy? How's it going? Ooh. Good to see you. Uh, How you doing? This is uh, Clay here. What's up, Clay? Hey, this is Trevor. Trevor. Yeah. Josh, um, I don't really know where to start, to be honest with you. It's a doozy, um, huh? First of all, how did you become interested in in skateboarding, and where did you? How did you get introduced to skateboarding? Well, I'll go back a little bit before that. The street I grew up on, uh, Birch Hill Drive, it was all boys, and there was probably six or seven houses of boys, and I was the run of block. So, kind of like your story when you grew up, where you were the youngest kid, and if you wanted to hang out and have friends, you had to like keep up with those kids. So. I wasn't bigger, big enough or strong enough to do the stuff they were doing. So what my great equalizer was doing stuff that they considered crazy. You know, whether it was like jumping off a roof of a house or a BMX bike or something like that or trying to say something witty. That's what I had to do to keep up with them. That's what kind of got the, the drive within me to like do things at a high level. Um, my first introduction to skateboarding was in the 70s and there was this crew of stoners that were... God, they're probably late teens, early 20s, and they would do like handstands on these old bonsai metal boards down the street, long hair, like sometimes catching in the wheel, just bombing hills. I couldn't believe these guys. I just, like, I want to do that. But I didn't have a skateboard, so that didn't come until later on. Uh, my 13th birthday, I got a uh, Madrid John Lucero board, going trucks, rat bone wheels. I mean, I could name every little part on that board. And that's when skateboarding got big in 1985, and I was hooked immediately. That just, uh, yeah, it was my passion from the first day I jumped on a board. Where did your passion uh, turn into profession? Back when I got into it, there was only two skateboarding parks in California. There was Upland Pipeline Skate Park and there was Del Mar. Upland Pipeline was the one we went to. My mom took us there. She loaded us up in her big green station wagon called the Hulk. We pulled up into there and there was just hundreds of kids wearing helmets and knee pads and elbow pads just staring down at these concrete holes. And I was just like, my mind was blown. I never knew there was such a thing as a professional skateboarder until that day. And that day I got to see my heroes. I got to see Chris Miller skate. From that day on, after, especially after seeing Chris Miller skate, I'm like, I want to be a pro skater. That's what I want to do one day. When, when did that transition happen from you aspiring to be a pro skater into starting to film and compete and get involved with brands? The first pro I ever saw skate was Chris Miller. And he was my hero. He still is my like skateboarding hero. I love Chris. And he's such a rad guy too. Um, I ended up turning pro. I, st I got sponsored by his company, Planet Earth, which was a sub company of 8th Street. And that's who I turned pro for. So, I mean, I couldn't have written it any better. Like, hey, the guy that you idolize is the guy that's going to turn you pro. And that's what happened. What were the team trips like? What was the camaraderie like? Um, what was the, the whole entire vibe of that like? Well, first off, we didn't get signed because it was nothing. It was like, you're going to get paid this much and that's what you get. There's no contract. It's just like handshake deals. And most of the time you didn't get paid anyways. It's, there was no money in skateboarding at all back then. There was a little bit, but not much. Uh, the vibe of it was just like, it was this brotherhood. It really was. It didn't matter whether you were... Uh, whether you're white, whether you're black, whether you're, you're Hispanic, it doesn't matter. Everybody was just one and the same. There was, no, there was no disparity amongst us. We were all just a crew of people having a good time. There was a lot of partying going on in those days. And I liked hanging out with the older crew. And that's where I found my niche in, the, in things. And, and skateboarding, you're, you're self-promoter. You market yourself. You market your identity that you, that you have going on. And, and it had been that way since before my time. I gravitated more towards the party people. Those, those were the guys. And I think I did that because it was easier for me to hold a beer in my hand and drink and say the cool stuff and be the cool guy than it was to actually go out and do the tricks. Things didn't come naturally for me like they do for those guys. I was a blue collar skater. I was not one of these guys that pick up a board and I figure out how to like tray flip, crooked grind this thing. That's not my jam. I'm, I can't do that stuff. I gravitated more towards the party people and that became the image and the identity that I ran with. Talk to me about that path and how that started well, to potentially dictate your life. Um, it's, it's very clear to where it came from me. So I was filming for the H Street video and I blew out my knee. And I started to rehab that. I qualified mm -hmm. for the next amateur contest. I got in, barely squeaked in like in 14th place and you had to get top 15 to get good to the next one. I made it. Yeah! 
A week later, I blew my elbow out and I couldn't skate because I was in a cast of a straight arm like this for six weeks. And, you know, it was bad. And I lost my edge. I lost my edge completely. I was hanging out with all of my friends from high school and all they did was drink. They would drink on Friday night. They drink on Saturday night. They drink during the weeks if their parents weren't home. And it just became a habitual thing. It became a regular thing for me. And when I started drinking at a young age, it was never like, hey, let's have a beer and chill. It was, let's get drunk. Every time I picked up a drink, it was, let's get drunk. So that really opened up the path for me. And the next thing that, that really cemented it was the fear. I had fear of getting hurt again. After being hurt, like back to back, two gnarly injuries, and that's what sent me down that path of destruction that got it going was the fear. I wasn't able to control the fear. I wasn't able to overcome the fear. I wasn't willing to, to get hurt again. And it was just so much easier just to put in just a little bit amount to shoot a photo for an ad or to place like top 10 in a contest, cash the check, stay semi-relevant, not as much as I should have been to keep the game going. It was all a hustle at that point. It wasn't like this is a real career to me. It was just like, I'm just gonna like get my next paycheck. Were you ever conscious that that was becoming a habit that was no. potentially self-destructing? 100% no, no. It was a party, I was a kid, this is, I, I'm not an alcoholic, I'm not a drug addict, I'm just a kid that likes to party and I got it all under control, bro. Did the self-destructive, in denial drinking go on until the time you got locked up? No, it went on beyond that. It never came when I was, when I was free. It came years later when I was in prison. Um, when I was in prison serving a life sentence. You know, not like when I was found guilty, not after a crime was committed, but in the midst of a life sentence, I finally figured out like, hey, this drinking thing doesn't work for me. Maybe I should do something about it. Maybe I really do have a problem here. You know, I ate that uh, big slice of humble pie that let me know, yeah. you got issues, dude. Yeah. You, need to, you need to start working on yourself a little bit. Talk to me about the night that your life changed. So there was things that, preceded it you know if uh if we get to like the big one then we skip some of the the building blocks that got me there you so know? there was some some red flags that have happened before that big one. Oh, huge yeah there was a so ton of red let's, flags. let's talk let's talk about that progression well you know you look at skateboarding in in the 80s and 90s it was illegal everywhere you go there was no skate parks it was kind of an outlaw sport right and we had this image and this identity of us against the cops you know we were we were rebels, we broke the law like every chance we got. Every time we went skateboarding, we were breaking the law basically. And anytime I'd get caught up in anything, it would end up in the magazines, the little rumor stuff, and it would be like promotion for me. You were gaining significance from, from that, from the skate industry. You were gaining recognition for rebelling. Street cred, 100%. 100% like miss, and it's all bullshit, but it's street cred. I totally understand what you're saying when you're 17, 18, 19. It's like, that's why gangs and the military recruit at that age, you know? Yes. You're malleable. And um, and all of a sudden you're, you're, you know, these people think you're so great because of you're getting all this attention, but hold on, you know, what is that attention really coming from and spawning from? Yeah, and your brain doesn't completely develop until you're 25 years old anyways in most people. So people pump you up, right? Yeah. They tell you you're great. And then when you're a kid, you get this ego going and any chance you get to inflate that ego, it just becomes a habitual thing as well. So the first time that I really got a good one was, was in 1993, in January of 93. And this one, really screwed me up. What happened is we were at a club down in San Diego after the Action Sports Retailer Trade Show and Ken Block, Danny Way, and another guy, Jason, we were leaving this club and um, Ken threw the keys to the van to this guy, Jason. And we were all going back to their house to crash out for the night. And we got on the freeway the wrong way. And the guy said, hey, Swindell, wake up. Cause I was passed out in the passenger seat. And he said, hey, we're supposed to be going north, right? He said, yeah back to Carlsbad and he goes, it says south, we're going south. And the two words that came out of my mouth that always lead to trouble came out, F it. End up in Tijuana driving around and uh, two pasty white kids in a Toyota cargo van uh, get pulled over. And the cops put us in the back of their car and drive us around. And if you grew up in Southern California, you know the scam with the Tijuana cops. You pay them off, they let you go. I had $53 in my pocket. I don't know why I remember $53, you know, 30 years later, but I still remember $53. Pulled out $40, I handed it to the cops, they dropped us off back at the van. 
We get back in the van, we start driving away and we're kind of chuckling about it. We just got jacked by the Tijuana cops. This is a cool story, right? This is gonna be great to tell everybody. Thrasher's gonna print it in a magazine. That we're, I'm gonna be a hero for this. Yeah, there goes that ego again. And the next thing you know, uh, we're trying to drive back and we get pulled over again. I've got $13. It's not gonna be enough to pay these next cops off. And I thought we were just paying them off for drunk driving. I didn't realize that once they got us in the back of the cop car, they started searching, they started finding guns. They found Ken Block's 22. they found my 45. And in Mexico, guns are a no-no. It's not like you're, you know, even though they're legal, it's a no-no down there. So they took me to jail. And the next day they let out the guy, Jason. Uh, I'm fairly certain he said everything was mine. They asked me about it and I just said, it's my employer's van. It was drawers clothing, DC shoes van at the time. And they ended up transferring me from the jail to the Mexican prison. Yeah, that's where I stayed for the next three months. So my skateboarding career was on hold and everybody in skateboarding knew about it, that I was in this Mexican prison in Tijuana for three months. Did you have any connection or communication with anyone that was family or friends? From Absolutely, yeah, I had, I had family and friends. Uh, they'd come down to visit on a regular basis. I had, my dad would cash my paychecks from skateboarding and bring it down. Uh, the prison in there is, is not what we think of prison. In, in America, it's a co-ed prison. It's like a little village inside. Um, there's kids that are running around in there that live in there that were like born and raised, conceived in that prison that have never left. Talk to me about the night that changed your life. Yeah, this is a big life changer for sure. So, so and leading up to it, um, what what run me through the story? Uh, well, what... I got a, I got out of Tijuana uh, one day. You know, after being in that prison and just living in this bizarro world for three months and just getting out. Everybody praised me when I came home. They were like, holy shit, you just survived Mexican prison. And I was a full-blown alcoholic. I mean, I was 20 years old. The local liquor store was running a tab for us. And I wasn't even old enough to buy beer, and they were running a tab for us. Every day I woke up drunk. Not like hungover, drunk still. And I'd need to drink again. And that's what I did. And I'd try to skate, drunk. And I'd get a clip here or there. No contest at that time. Continued that dysfunction and right up until July 7th, 1993. And that was the night that we ended up at a bar, a private party at a bar, uh, where my life changed forever. Danny Way, uh, Ronnie Bertino were like the two professional skateboarders there. And it was that guy, Jason, that I got busted with in Tijuana. He was this aspiring rapper at the time. And there was going to be this demo tape release party. There used to be tapes back then, cassette tapes that people would release. And him and like his manager had like three other guys that he was doing. And, uh, putting out they were going to do a show and whatnot and I really didn't want to go because I'm I don't like I'm not big into rap music um, you know there's some of it I like but whatever but my friend told me the two things that I really th was into girls and, and free booze so of course I'm going to come up for that so that's where we end up uh, midway through the night uh, Danny Way tells me that there was a guy bothering him and Danny tells me who it is so I tell the guy hey it's a private party you got to leave dude like you're gonna get beat up here if you keep doing this. You gotta go. I walk him out of the bar, uh, give him a beer for the road, and tell him, just don't come back, dude. And he doesn't even nod at me. He just kind of looks right through me. And I thought he was, I thought he was on heroin, actually, because I saw people on heroin for the first time in Tijuana prison, and that's something I'd never been around before. So that's what I thought he was on, because he was so unfocused. What I didn't know is that this man, Keith Ogden, had left the hospital the day before against medical advice with a large hematoma on his brain and he was still suffering from that injury. It had decreased in size, but he still wasn't able to speak. Um, just normal motor skill functions he didn't have. Unbeknownst to all of us at the time, we just thought he was loaded. Went back in the bar about 20 minutes later. Um, we hear there's a fight out front. I go out front, and the first thing I see is Danny way out cold, bleeding from the mouth. And another friend is holding on to Danny because he was just limp. I asked who hit Danny. The person who became my co-defendant in this case, Steve Mateus, I think it was him that said, that guy sucker punched Danny. And I'm like, what, where is he? I don't, I'm pissed now. Like, I warned this guy and he knocked my friend out. Where's he at? I want a piece of this dude. Couldn't find him anywhere. Uh, we got Danny back inside the bar. I asked him what happened. He had no memory of anything at all. That went on, what went on. A little while later, we see Steve Mateus again and another guy kicking at something beneath the bar. Guy walks up to him and they have a conversation. They're all looking down at something. So I walk over there and it was Keith Ogden. 
the guy who I had been told had knocked Danny away unconscious. So we pick him up and we're taking him out of the back of the bar. My intentions are really to beat this guy's ass because he'd knocked my friend out and I'm mad, I'm pissed out. How dare he knock my friend out after I warned him your ego again, right? Not what happened. What actually did happen is Danny sucker punched him, knocked him to the concrete, and then a bouncer knocked Danny out. That's what actually happened, but in my mind, I'm still thinking that this guy was the one that knocked Danny out. I walk him out of the back of the bar, and I really want to beat his ass, but he can't fight. There's no way. And I've got my arm around him trying to get him away from the bar so nobody breaks it up. And as I'm walking away from the bar, this guy Robert comes running up from behind, jumps into the back of him, either kicks him in the back of the head or the back, and I've got him like this. His head slams into my mouth, and falls down. I'm immediately, all of my anger is focused at Keith at this time and I unleashed on him and I kicked him. The guy testified that I kicked him three to five times, which I probably did. Maybe even more than that. Uh, the guy was out cold. Steve Mateus starts kicking him and I'm wiping blood from my mouth where his head hit me. I tell Steve to stop. He does. We, uh, he's laying in the middle of the street. And I know that Keith didn't cause this. I know the Robert guy caused this. They kicked him. But Robert's being appalled. He's apologizing. Josh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. And I'm just looking down. I'm frustrated because I didn't want to do this to the dude. But this is the guy that caused it. So I said, let's get him out of the street. We carry him out of the street, put him down on the sidewalk. And I'm thinking, okay, he's just drunk. He's going to wake up. Cops show up. I'm a skater. I got warrants. What do I do? I run. I'm gone. Cops everywhere. I get on the phone the next morning. I start calling people and I call a friend, Kevin, that's dead now. And he says, that guy died. And I go, what? And he said, he's dead. That guy that you beat up outside, he's dead. And I'm like, there's no way. I've, I've had my ass kicked that bad before. There's no way. I've seen people have their asses kicked way worse than this. There's no way this guy is dead. But he died. He had a pre-existing brain injury and he died right there on the streets. So we went back in the bar and unknown to me, Steve Mateus went back outside and stomped Keith to an unrecognizable state. Later on that night, Steve was bragging to our friend Enar while washing blood off his hands in the bathroom that he had just killed the dude. Enar asked him why he killed the guy and Steve said he did what he had to do because the guy knew his name. That was the crime in itself which took place. What do you what do you truthfully think ended that man's life? Was it the kicks to the head? What what exactly did it come down to? Do you have any idea? What they testified in the corner, what he testified to, was that he was on an irreversible path with death. He was going to die after Danny hit him. He was going to die no matter what. You basically were there at the tail end of it. Yeah, they'd already. That's dragged. kind of what I'm trying to get at. Is that you, yeah, were, so, you weren't even there for the for the for the whole no, thing? No, so. Th there was one witness, a guy named Scott Weber, who was a friend of all of ours, another skater, um, which was actually kind of funny when he testified at trial because they asked him how much he'd had to drink that night, and he said nothing because he's the designated driver, which was the only sober guy in the place was the guy that witnessed that. He was sitting outside on the, on the brick wall, and he saw Danny and Keith standing there, and he said Danny looked at him, smiled, and then sucker punched Keith. That was the what he testified to. Keith fell straight back, hitting his head with a loud thud on the on the thing. Um, there's no doctor on the planet that could tell you that hey, it was this blow, this blow, or this blow that caused his death. You know, in the end, it doesn't matter. Somebody lost their life. Yeah. You know, a mother lost her son, a sister lost their brother. Um, Keith lost everything that he ever could have been in this world that night outside of this bar. Regardless, I take responsibility for it. 100% my responsibility for it. I should have been the bigger man to stop everything before it started. One thing I do know is I shouldn't even have been there in the first place. I'm 20 years old. I should have been, you know, skateboarding or I should have been at home. I shouldn't have been at a bar yeah. at 20 years old. Steve Mateus, my co-defendant in this, he was 17 years old. What was he doing at a bar that night, you know? But if I look at it from that point, it sounds like I'm making excuses for it. And I'm not. I own, 100% own my part in all this. I laid low for three weeks. When you I, say laid low, explain I was, that. I was with a girl that I was seeing at the time, kind of seeing at the time, and uh, I just started hanging out with her. I didn't want to turn myself in. I wasn't like on the run, but I just wasn't turning myself in. I wasn't around people. Three weeks later on my 21st birthday, we were meeting this lady that was giving up information, which is a long other story. It's not even relevant. but. She was giving the cops information to try to get out of a crime that she had committed. Like, I know about this crime. So she was setting us up the whole time, the lady that had my ID. You want to talk about alcoholism and how screwed up this is and how it relates to this is, it's my 21st birthday, I'm now legal to drink. She has my driver's license at the house and I want that so I can buy beer. Like, how screwed up? I'm wanted for murder right now and that is how important it is to get my ID so I can buy beer. We were going to meet at the Little League field there. We're 
driving around there. I think I had a beer in my lap. This girl, Christine, was driving, and all of a sudden, this guy comes up, pulls up next to us, a black dude with a Raiders hat on, holding, like, I don't know, there's a 45 or a 9, something semi-auto like this at us, and, like, back in the early 90s, people wearing Raiders and Kings, that's, like, gang stuff, and I'm like, who the f is this guy gonna kill me right now? And then another car pulled up in front, and another car, and another car. Ten undercover cops and two black and white cops just swarmed me and arrested me, took me into custody, charged me with first degree murder. They took me to jail, they charged me with murder, and uh, the chaos of uh, incarceration and jail began. I didn't have money for an attorney. You know, as a poor skater, I made like seven, eight hundred, maybe nine hundred bucks a month in those days. Uh, I had to take uh, a court appointed attorney, and you get what you pay for when it comes to legal representation. Um, first trial ended in a mistrial, and we went back to trial the second time, and they offered us a plea bargain, uh, Steve Mateus and us both, 11 years. I already had two, over two years in, I think I had like 26 months in, I would have served like five more years and I would have been home. I would have been home by the time I was 27, by the time I was your age, right now. And that's when my life would have started. Um, too prideful, too much ego involved. Um, and those two words came out again. Let's go to trial. Steve Mateus then took a deal for where he served three years in exchange for his testimony against me. And so he testified against you? Testified against me, and which wouldn't have been a bad thing if everything he testified to was truthful. But it was just filled with lies. All of the people that witnessed me attacking Keith, that witnessed uh, Steve attacking Keith, he now said that they were involved in it. He said that Mark was involved, and this guy Enar was involved, and Eric was involved, and Robert, and three other guys were involved, and none of it was true. I don't know why, if he was trying to get even with those guys, or if that's what the district attorney wanted him to testify to, to set the stage for the trial, but either way, that's what he's testifying to now. And I still felt like, hey, this is going to be a manslaughter. It's not going to be any worse than that. Why would I take the maximum amount of time for manslaughter when that's when it's going to be? And this is what my attorney's telling me as well. We got to the jury deliberation, and at that point, the judge decides which jury instructions the jury's going to get, which determines what they're allowed to find me guilty of. The judge 100% denies all assault, involuntary, or manslaughter. The only options this jury has are first and second degree murder, and those carry life sentences. My mind was blown. I knew I was screwed at that point. There was no way. I was 100% guilty of something. It wasn't like they were just gonna say, okay, go home. They deliberated for a day. The jury came back and asked. The question read, jurors would like to know if J. Period Swindell can be found guilty of manslaughter instead of murder. And that's huge because manslaughter, the max is 11 years. Five and a half would be half time. I already have two years in. I would have been home a lot sooner. Second degree murder carries a 15 years to life sentence. And in those days, if you had one of those sentences, you're not coming home. You're just, you're done. You're going to prison, you're gonna die in there. That's the way it was. In first degree, same thing. It's just 25 years to life. The judge said, no, this is a murder case. Go back in there. The judge 100%, Judge Trammell, wanted to make sure that I was found guilty of murder and not manslaughter. Uh, they went back into deliberation, found me guilty of second degree murder. And when the judge thanked them for their service as jurors, the jurors asked him, hey, is, is this kid going to be dealt with specially? Because we don't feel that this kid in any way in, intended to kill this guy. And we just want to know if he's going to be dealt with specially because we don't feel like he deserves this crazy sentence. And the judge just basically denied what they said. Said, nope, we know, I know how to deal with him. This is what he gets, and that's the way it's going to be. Sentenced 15 years to life and shuffled off to prison at that point. Judge Trammell, my judge, uh, he... He's dead now, but he is a crooked mother He would have prostitutes come through his courtroom and he would have the bailiff bring them back into his chambers and give them blowjobs or, or to give them time served and let them go. Otherwise, they would serve 90 days in the county jail. How did you find that out? This all came out about a year after I was convicted. And how long after that did you find out about it? Right when it happened. So they, they made the did, newspapers. Like did you big. try to fight that at all and say, I have a crooked judge on my hands? Yeah, they don't hear that. It's kind of like, uh, you know, somebody comes to tell me about a problem with you. I'm going to have your back, dude. You know, I don't want to hear it. That's my friend. I'm going to have your back. You, got, you know, that's what they do. It's the good old boys club. So at this point, you are convicted of murder. What happens? Well, you wait in the county jail to um, catch the chain, which is a prison bus or county jail bus that drops you off into prison. Um, 
waited for a couple of weeks and they pick you up and they took me to North Kern State Prison in Delano outside of Bakersfield. You sit there in that prison for a few months until they evaluate you and determine what your security level is going to be and what prison you go to. I was there for like six months until I was transferred to Calipatria, which is down by the Salton Sea. Uh, maximum security prison. Um, I was there for about a year maybe and didn't get caught for any of the chaos that I was involved in. It's not like I was good by any means. I just didn't get caught. So you were still causing problems and, and you didn't just change overnight. No. From the moment you got convicted. No. Your, your issues were they got worse. following on. They got worse. The insanity got worse. The dysfunction got worse. You know, you put a 23 year old kid with a fresh life sentence into this meat grinder, what's gonna happen? You choose your path at that point, and I chose the path of wanting to be cool, wanted to be a tough guy. You know, drugs and violence, that's what's respected in prison. I didn't have any drugs, so I raised my hand to get involved in a lot of violent stuff. Some higher power was looking out for me because I never got caught. Never got caught for any of the stuff that I got involved in. in Can there. you talk about some of that stuff you got involved in? Yeah. Um, I guess the statute of limitations gone now. Um, you know, fights, I've a uh, child molester one time I beat up pretty bad. Another child molester I st um, Where is your mindset at when you realize that you might spend the rest of your life there? Does that make you even worse off? Or are you just pissed off and even more careless? Do you, do you think you're going to get out of it somehow? What's your thought process? Well, like? I had an appeal process going. And I banked everything on my appeal. That was my sliver of hope that I held on to was that appeal because you're not going to escape from prison. It's just not going to happen. You've got gun towers everywhere. You've got no man's land. You've got the big barbed wire fence and you've got an electric fence that'll kill you. Another one. And these prisons are out in the middle of nowhere. You're not going to escape. My only way of getting out of prison at this point is either in a body bag or on my appeal. And I am banking everything on this appeal. And my appeal was 100% legit. This judge should have given the jury the option of the lesser included offense, which was manslaughter. My case would be overturned. I'd get a new trial. They'd plea bargain me out for time served and I'd go home. And I'd tell everybody this. I would call my collect calls to all my friends, write my letters to my friends. Yeah, I'll be out next year, bro. We're going to go snowboard. We're going to ride dirt bikes. We're going to go surfing. I'm going to go to Hawaii. I've never been, I'm going to do all that, you know. But I got a life sentence. And, I, and <laughs> yeah, so my appeal finally gets to... The Ninth Circuit Court of Appeal. I ended up transferring. I thought it was going to be 18 months until my appeal would get there. It ended up taking another five years, I think. From Calipatra, I got transferred to Lancaster Prison. I dropped to a level three. Then I went to Pleasant Valley, another level three. Then my points dropped uh, significantly down to a level two, which was Soledad at the time. Waiting for that ruling from the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. And I went to my collect call my dad on the phone, and uh, they did the whole, this calls coming from a correctional facility, press one, press, so my dad accepts. I'm like, hey dad, what's going on? He's like, hey bud. I could tell in his voice. I could tell right there in his voice, my appeal was denied. And I said, it's denied, isn't it? He goes, yeah. I'm like, Fuck. I love you dad. I go, I'll talk to you later. I got, I got to walk, I hung up. Started walking back. It was the first time I ever had a panic attack. The anxiety, like all of it just sunk in as I was walking back. The realization that the last sliver of hope that I had was gone. I was done. I was now officially spending the rest of my life in prison. So I start walking back to my cell and just these emotions that were coming over me, I wanted to cry, but I'm in a place that I can't cry. You're not allowed to show emotions in there. You have to be something else. And yeah, it hit me really hard. And it was nine years later that I got, eight years later, I got transferred from Soledad to the prison in San Luis Obispo, which was considered a medical facility at the time. I had some knee issues. I had a thing called ulcerative colitis, and that's where they wanted me. So they transferred me down there, and I hated it. I couldn't stand it. I thought, like, everybody there is a rat. They're a piece of shit. I'm still caught up in that mindset of the prison mentality. And there was a lot of rats and piece of shits and so child that molesters and all that there. Um, and I did not want to be there at all. I just wanted to get the f out of there. Um, luckily for me, there was a guy that I used to play, uh, I used to play baseball with in Soledad. And he was an old timer and he pulled me aside. He goes, look, Josh, the tides are changing. Like the political tides are changing. You need to like, just keep a clean record. You need to do these programs. F those guys, let them do their thing. Just stay away from the bullshit. You and I, we're going to go work out. 
We're gonna go do pull-ups. We're gonna go hit the bag. We're gonna run. We're gonna play sports. This is what we're gonna do. And that's what I did. I don't know if I flipped the switch or if my hope switch switched to the parole board at that time where this is what I'm gonna put all my eggs in that basket. And I just started diving into every program imaginable in there. The parole board told me in 2006, she asked me if I was an alcoholic and I told her no. I said, I don't drink anymore. How can I be an alcoholic, right? And she asked me a few questions and I go, well, maybe I am. I dove into AA meetings hard. Like I just start seeing people in there that I could relate to. Like guys would come in from the outside and they'd come in and share their experience, strength and hope and what they've been through, you know? And I'm like, wow, that dude gets it. That dude's just like me. You know, his first drink was just like mine. And it's always like that. He just goes until whatever. So that program in itself was like the biggest life-changing thing for me. It, it just made me peel back the onion of myself, look within myself, be accountable for it. Yeah, it was life-changing, man. It really was. It sounds like at some point when you realized that you could have a, you could have a potential impact by putting in the work, you started to put in the work in any way that you could. Yeah. But talk to me about, like you said, you quit drinking years ago. Yeah. I mean, I quit drinking uh, July of 96 in Calipatria when I was there. Whatever you need or want to get your hands on in prison is there. For the most part, somebody got killed on the yard and they were doing a weapon search and one of the trustees had some wine. He comes by and he says, hey, I got some wine. The cops are coming by. I need to get rid of it. Slides it under the door to us. We drink like two cups of it. Got into my stomach where it was like a nice warm place for it to for start that fermentation process again and I was throwing up. And that's sitting on my knees, throwing up into a stainless steel toilet with a fresh life sentence. That's when I said, I'm done drinking. I can't do this anymore but I still carried all of the defects around with me and I still smoked weed because in my mind, smoking weed wasn't bad. You know, take some pills, that's not bad either. So I continued along that path until 2008. My dad came visiting, visiting me on my birthday, uh, July 28th, 2008. And we were out in the visiting room and my dad started clutching his chest. And I thought, my dad's having a heart attack right in front of me. I thought he was dying right in front of me. And I was scared shitless. And I'm like, I'm gonna go get a doctor. My dad grabs my arm and he's just like, you know, wouldn't let me go. He's a big guy, he wouldn't let me go. So finally he was able to talk and he said it was just heartburn. And I go, dad, that's not heartburn. You need to get this checked. And he gave me his word that he would make an appointment on Monday to go get checked. Seeing that was pretty, it made me want to be there for my dad, right? I went back to the cell that night, um, back to the yard. Old Italian guy, Paisan, Danny Principato. Uh, he showed up with a big joint for my birthday. We went out in the yard, we smoked it, and went back to the cell. And uh, right before lock out, lockdown that night, before count, he comes by my cell and uh, says, happy birthday to me one more time. I love you, brother, happy birthday. And I'm like, love you too, Danny. I'll see you in the morning, Paisan. Cop comes by, keys the doors. I'm in cell 57. They go all the way down, turn, he's an 82. All of a sudden the alarm goes off. And I can only see, you know, this far down I couldn't see all the way. We no, no idea whose cell it was. Cops run in, 20 minutes later, an ambulance shows up. Here comes Paisan on a gurney with them beating on his chest. And I'm just sitting here in the window watching my friend that had just like, his last words to me were, I love you, brother. He had a year and a half to go and he had 25 years in already. Paisan died. He had a heart attack and died. And he had heart conditions, but you know, that, that was the wake up call. Seeing my dad that morning in the visiting room almost have a heart attack, seeing Paisan you know, die of a heart attack. And from July 28th, 2008 on, I've been like sober 100% and active in, in my recovery. I think I heard a quote from you saying that you had to grow up to get out of prison. Yeah, um, 100%. It sounds like it took you a while to, to see that. And then once you did, you just hit that path religiously. I dove in 100%. I committed myself just like it was like, like do this kickflip down the stairs or do this yeah. handrail or land this. That was my commitment. And it was like the commitment when you're, a, when you're a young kid where that's all your focus is all day long. And that was, that was that. I was involved in this inmate tour guide thing. And it was racially segregated or racially balanced where we had, uh, we had a black, a white, uh, a Mexican, um, and an other, which was an Asian guy. And the Asian guy and the black guy left, and it was just the white guy, me, and this Mexican guy, Eddie. The staff that ran it said, hey, Josh, we need to get a black dude in here for this program. Do you know any? So I said, yeah, I know a black guy. So this guy, Tommy Reese, I knew. I said, hey, I want you involved in this program. You're well-spoken. You present good. 
you're not going to perv out on the students that come in. You know, I want you involved in this program. He goes, okay, cool. But my Sally JD, I really want him involved. And the next thing you know, they become a regular part of our tour. These guys had been programming, trying to get out of prison for a while. Um, Eddie was a really good friend of mine, the Mexican guy. He had a, a car to car shooting in the early 90s, gang related out of San Diego. Uh, Tommy Reese, the guy that I got first, he had a really bad crime as well. Uh, his friend was murdered, and, or his friend was shot and paralyzed, and he was told that this guy did it, and he was a gang member in LA and shot that guy point blank range and killed him. Really bad crime. Jerome Dixon, the last guy, 16 year old kid from Oakland. Um, got arrested for a crime that he had no knowledge of. But he was a black kid in Oakland, so they said, you did it. They arrested him, interrogated him for 25 hours until he signed a false confession for a crime he not only didn't do, but he had no knowledge of. So the four of us doing our program with our tour guide thing, where we do them every couple weeks, and a new class that would come in, uh, we got really close. And we were able to break down the racial barriers of prison that you know, I'm not allowed to talk to a black guy, a black guy's not talk, allowed to talk to me. All that stuff was broken down. We were able to interact on a regular basis and we'd all been in prison for such a long time that nobody was gonna say anything to us on the yard anyway. Somebody might mumble some racial shit under their breath, but they weren't gonna say it to my face or Eddie's face or it, it just wasn't gonna happen. So the four of us started doing mock parole hearings and we studied the law, what the parole board could and could not use against us anymore. The first guy up was, was Jerome, JD. Um, he went into the parole board hearing and he'd already been denied like four or five times and he went in there and he said, this shows that I didn't do the crime, but more so this is why I no longer pose an unreasonable risk to society and why I should be paroled. And he laid it out there. That is a death sentence. If you go in there and you say, I didn't do the crime, they view you as lacking insight, lacking remorse, instant denial, come back, see us in 10 years, whatever. They not only found him suitable for parole after he did that, but the district attorney who showed up there to oppose this hearing, said, congratulations, Jerome, I'm going to contact the Innocence Project on your behalf. He was the first guy to go. That was in November of 2011. How something long like had he done up until that point? 21 and a half years by the time he For got out. For something that he had no, no idea? No knowledge of at all. Nothing. Like, no clue. They just said, he's a black guy, the black suspect, we're going to get him. He didn't even meet anywhere near the description. Of, I mean, he was 16 years old, probably weighed like 140 pounds. They said this guy was like 6'3", 230 pounds. Didn't even, not even close. And his only option to get out was 21 years later. Yeah, 21 and a half years. Let's not forget that half. That's yeah. a long time. Yeah. So the next one up was Eddie. I told you his crime, gang to gang, uh, car to car shooting, whatever. Went in, was found suitable for parole, and he was deported. He lives in Rosarito today. He was the second one up. He works with kids down there and is making positive changes down there. He's married, he's got two kids, he's killing it in life. Uh, third one up was me. I was found suitable for parole. Here I am today with you. Um, came home November, excuse me, September 5th, 2012. Tommy Reese, uh, the last guy of our, of our four-man crew, he came home about a month after I did. Why didn't you ever get any tattoos in prison? <laughs> yeah, I didn't, uh, I never wanted to like get this fancy paint job and show people, yeah, look how cool I am or how tough I am, you know? It, it, it's just not who I am. Yeah. And you and I have talked about that. Yeah. You would get your tattoos removed yeah. and you're like, yeah, I've got other scars that, you know, I've got my scars to tell my stuff, yeah. you know? I just feel comfortable in my own skin where I don't need it. Nine, how, how long? 19 years, one month, and eight days. You can't explain that. No one will ever know truthfully, you know, what you've been through. I don't think anybody will ever know what anybody, whether it be you, whether it be Alex, whether it be anybody, what they've truthfully been through. Yeah. And, and unless they've been through it. I mean, we all have our, our, our trials that we go through in our life. I mean, whether it be just, you know, basic struggles or whether it be like, I can't, I can't move my f legs, right? Right. We all go through shit. It's just perspective. What did you imagine your path being had you not been convicted? Nothing good. There was no good going to come of it. I was going to go right back into what I was doing. If I would have been let out, the party would have continued. The chaos would have continued. The violence would have continued. So what you're saying is that you were on a path of destruction that was leading you in a certain direction that there was no way out of. A blind person could see that. It was only going to be a matter of time before you either ended up in prison or killed yourself or something. 100%, but I see that in hindsight now. Like at the time, I lived for the day. There was no, I, I couldn't imagine being 21 years old back then. Like that was old, like really, 21? I can't imagine being 20, 25? 
married kids like a dog a house no i can't imagine anything like that my life was so short-sighted i mean i'm 40 i'm almost 49 almost 50 years old i get to like ride dirt bikes i get to, to snowboard i get to skate i get to like go on awesome trips i got like a beautiful wife i've got like two dogs i mean i am living like this life beyond my wildest dream sure there could be more material stuff or there could be more money i mean everybody can have that stuff but the things that really matter in life I'm the richest motherfucker on the planet. I really am, dude. There's there's no other way to describe it. Yeah. There, there just isn't. Especially with everything in your path. It's like you can't really appreciate something until you know what it's like to not have that, you know? And you being where you've been for so long and then coming out and really genuinely appreciating each one of those important things is probably indescribable. The the activities, the experiences, like when when we're skateboarding. Yeah. You have all those tricks, and I was so blown away by that. You know, you're doing a frontside grind or a tail slide or whatever, and you realize that that is ingrained in you yeah. <laughs> from from what you're 14 or 15 yeah, or something. Yeah. But not to go too off topic, like those actually meaningful things, like mm -hmm. your your relationships, you know, the experiences you get to enjoy now. You actually enjoy those things so much more probably than the everyday person because they haven't had that complete contrast not only that i mean just down to the very basics of wiping your butt with good toilet paper dude i'm not using this state issue sandpaper that they give you i mean and things has not been a, life has not been a walk in the park since i've been home i mean there's been real life struggles i mean i almost died i had like this surgery that like they ripped my guts out rebuilt my inners i had watched my dad take his last breath i've like I mean, I'm married. That's hard enough as it is, right? I mean, I've had like real life struggles to deal with and, and you know, employment wise, I mean, on paper, I'm a convicted murderer. I, I go to get a job and it's like, how long is this job gonna last till the background check comes and I'm axed, you know? And this has happened to me. It's happened to me multiple times. My wife does good. I'm making money now doing what I do and beyond grateful and appreciative for everything I have yeah. you know just being able to like go have a session with you today like sit here and hang out today I am grateful for everything I have in my so life. cool man yeah your last days in prison when did you realize that you were going to get out or potentially be getting out so the way it works is once you're found suitable for parole by the parole board there's a five-month waiting period for the first four months, it goes through the process of them, uh, the board like just dotting their I's, crossing their T's, making sure that everything you've given them is legit and that you should, uh, that that parole hearing will stand. Then the last 30 days, so four months later, the last 30 days of the, the five months, it goes to the governor for review and the governor can just strip it for whatever reason he wants. Every governor has that power in California. So even though I was found suitable, I didn't know if I was gonna come home or not. Um, I had no victim's opposition from Keith's family, which was beneficial to me coming home, but I didn't know. It was still the unknown, but I just held on to hope. It was my time. It was really my time. I had gotten with uh, my now wife, Christy, at this time. We'd become, we were friends forever, and then we'd actually started a relationship the last two years that I was in there. My dad, with his health, which was declining, everything was just coming together for me, and it was my time. How did you connect with your wife in prison? Well, we'd write letters for years. Um, my best man, Mark Oblo, he's best man at my wedding in 2014, but uh, in 1992, he was, uh, we were all in LA at a contest, or in Orange County at a contest, and uh, we were all hanging out at his house crashing, and she came over to visit a friend, and that's when we became friends. But there was no attraction for either one of us. We were just friends, and that was it, and we kept it simple. Um, she had a kid, uh, he's 25 now, great kid, and everything was about him. Seeing somebody that's so selfless in their life to give of themselves 100% to somebody else was like the most attractive quality. And plus, and she's also hot, she's, she's a great woman. Killer personality, everything about her is great, I love this woman. But we would stay in touch through letters, she'd send pictures, I'd send pictures of visiting, pictures to her and whatnot. Fast forward to 2010, I got, uh, black market uh, cell phone while I was in there. So if I would've got found with it, I would've been, got a disciplinary write up, denied parole. But it was my, it was my like connection to the outside world where I could like, once we're locked down and I watch the cops, cops are gone, pick up that phone, call people. You know, I'd just call all of my friends. It just instilled more hope in me at that point. Like I'd, I'd get pictures, they'd text me pictures, which was kind of weird. It was an old flip phone, you'd have to 
for an A, you'd have to hit A or B three times. It was one of those weird ones. But it just, it just instilled that in me. And anyways, her and I got really close at that time. Every other relationship I'd been in, I cheated on every girl. I was never faithful. Um, and I treated them like crap. I was a dick. And I didn't want to be that anymore. I wanted to be respectful. So she picked me up from the gate when I paroled, which was amazing. Um, Talk to me about that moment when you... When you walked out of the gates at the end of your prison sentence, oh, dude. what, walk me through that. They call you out to, they call me for release early in the morning, like seven in the morning, and cop walks me over to receiving and release building and they start reading off your paperwork and you have to go through your name and everything a million times to make sure it's you. I mean, they already knew who I was, so I'd been there for so long, but you still have to do that. Two black guys in the tank with me. One guy was like a, he was like a crip from San Bernardino or something. Super quiet, respectful, but super quiet. He was nervous, you could tell about going home. And the other guy was just like talking about how he's got all this money and how he's like high roller and this and that. And I said, so who's picking you up? He goes, oh, I'm taking the bus home. I want to surprise my family. So full of shit, you know? <laughs> so you get your clothes that you dress out and I left all my new stuff. Uh, like I had a brand new pair of shoes I left with somebody. I had some old skate clothes that uh, that my buddy Ryan Kingman sent me, so I wore those out the gate. The three of us walk out together. I look over to the right, and there's Christy standing there with high heels on, this short black dress with a yellow ribbon around that said, Welcome Home, standing next to a brand new convertible BMW. And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> like, holy shit, dude, like, this is mine. Like, holy, like, whoa. And I walk over. I put my box down and we just started hugging and kissing. I could just feel the warmth of her body through through this little dress. And I'm just like, oh my God, this is so crazy. Like, I'm really free. And then uh, the sergeant that walked me out just screams over, Swindale, get the f off the property. And I look back, all right, boss. And as I look back, I see the two guys getting on the bus. They got nobody there to pick them up. They're wearing like these sweats that they give you to walk out with their boxes, getting on to like a prison bus to go get dropped off at a bus station to go home. And gra you want to talk about gratitude on another level, bro. It was just like the love that I felt in that moment walking into her arms was just so euphoric, dude. I was like literally high on endorphins or something as we drove away. She handed me my uh, an iPhone 4. That was the new phone at the time. And I'm like, how do I turn this thing on? There's no <laughs> keyboard. What do I do? I'm using like rotary dial type shit. <laughs> so we drive away. We get on one. We start going south. And I'm call, I call my dad. I call my mom. I call a couple friends, whatnot. And they're like, congratulations. Yeah. I'm like, I'll see you guys soon. And we pulled over. We're heading south. And we stop out at uh, Gaviota Lookout. So I tried skating out, outside on that little rough asphalt out there, tried to kickflip, landed the worst kickflip in my <laughs> life, but I landed one, dude. It had been 20 years, I landed one. <laughs> the skies cleared up, these pelicans came over, and we just sat there and just made out like we were high school kids, just feeling the warmth of each other's body, man. It was just so rad. I got to see my mom and spend time with my dad that night, and uh, life began, dude. Wow. A new life began at that point. Wow. Are there any final words that you could give to somebody that's in their early 20s that might think they have it all figured out that um, that your wisdom might benefit? You know, every situation's unique. Every person's unique. I don't think I could, one piece isn't going to fit for everybody, you know. But sharing my experience and, and what I've been through, a universal piece that like, hey, life is precious. Uh, it's not just about you. There's other people in the world that your actions affect, you know. I don't think there's just like one little like, tagline that you could throw out there to, to to throw to just like give somebody this infinite wisdom you know yeah, you, no. you, ha you have to like really dive in and, and a person has to be receptive as well to it but i do think that if somebody sits down and has the attention span to hear somebody's story like mine or hear somebody's story like yours that that's that's been through some shit. i think they could come away with it with the perspective that they're not going to make the same mistakes that i have um, maybe they w might not want to throw down as hard as they as you have, you know, might want to taper it back or take some caution, you know. I will say that for me, I wish that I would have gotten my drinking under control, my alcoholism under control at a young age. Uh, I started drinking at 12 years old and I drank alcoholically from the very first drink. And from that first drink at 12, it just steamrolled. And I never was able to have a social drink. I couldn't drink like that in any way, shape or form. If, I, if somebody would have gotten at me at 12 years old, that I would have listened to and respected, there would have been somebody, Keith Ogden might be alive today, 
You know, I sure as hell wouldn't have went to prison. 20 years of not seeing stars or being able to smell a tree or climb up. Pet a dog, dude. Like, that is the raddest thing to, like, play with a dog, dude. I, I mean, I love dogs anyways, but the only dogs I saw in there were drug-sniffing dogs when they come in to search the cell, and I couldn't play with them. You know, cuddling with my wife, dude. Like, everything you could imagine that we've got in this world, I am grateful for. You know, I've got like 30 days of snowboarding in this year. That's so cool, I love it. Everything I get to do, dude, like my life is so good today. It's not, my problems are quality problems. They are not real problems in this world at all. There's people that are starving and looking for like where they're gonna eat, where they're gonna sleep tonight. I don't have those problems, man. I, I have a great life. There's nothing that, that I can complain about. There's nothing, I mean I could, but it wouldn't be legit. Life is good. It's great, bro. Thank you genuinely from the bottom of my heart for yeah. sharing this. I know it's not an easy thing to do and, and let alone revisit things that you probably don't want to think about again. So I, I can't thank you enough. I'm just glad to be able to spend time with you, bro, and do this. Yes, brother. Appreciate it. Till next time. Thanks for watching. <laughs>